you'll have to forgive me. I think I got my invitations mixed up uh, because I thought this was a roast. <laughs> <laughs> and I started off by trying to write a limerick saying, there once was a lady from Philly <laughs> who thought her publisher quite silly. But then I was trying to find something in Spanish that would rhyme with Philly and silly, and I just gave up. So instead, I'm going to tell you the secret history or how Edie Grossman ruined my life <laughs> and then reclaimed it. <laughs> It all began with a gift, a book. The seduction had been underway, going full steam ahead, I should say, for several weeks. But what sealed the deal, what led to me spending 10 years in captivity, was that book. Did I mention its title? I opened the bag from Shakespeare and Co., the lower Broadway address, uh, which is now sadly shuttered. And inside, there it was love in the time of cholera. I was supposed to be studying for my comprehensive exams in Italian, reading Dante, Ariosto, Leopardi. Instead, I sat down immediately and read Gabriel Garcia Marquez for the first time. I won't say in one breath, but in two. And when I reached the end of the novel, at that wonderful moment when Fermina Das finally gives in to the ministrations of Florentino Arisa sits back and slugs a glass of aguardiente on that steamboat stranded in the middle of the Magdalena River. Well, I sat back, drank a shot of aguardiente, and surrendered to the attentions of my paramour. So much for the edifying influence of literature. I woke up 10 years later to the shambles of a Latin romance, riven with jealousy, betrayal, and way too many aguardientes, and decided that I had had quite enough of Colombia. Because when I break up, I don't break up with a person, I break up with their entire culture. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies to Jaime Marrique. <laughs> <laughs> then it was time for Mexico. Another paramour, Mexican, Carlos Fuentes, Mayra Montero, Sor Juana, not a chaste relationship. And when that relationship ended, amid too many tears, fears, and rancheras, there was Edie herself, no longer speaking through the mask or the voice, uh, through the ventriloquistic art of translation. But Edie and I became friends at just around that point, and I learned to relish our conversation, her voice, her love, I know many people who read a lot. I know people who read as much as her, but I don't think that I've ever met anyone who enjoys good, write, good writing quite as much as Edie does. And I'm just here to uh, thank her for that love of literature, thank her for the conversations, thank her for the many good stiff drinks that we've had, and thank you for this gift of a lifetime of reading. Hello, my name is Eric Skowala, and I'm Edie's lawyer, and I'm <laughs> uh, I have lots of great stories I could tell you about Edie, but alas, the attorney-client privilege prohibits me from saying anything. Um, when I met Edie, which is now many years ago, she was actually not my client. She was a very close friend and colleague's client in New Hampshire. Uh, and when Neil suddenly passed, and it was to me to retain some of his clients and what I wanted most was he. And um, I've never been more nervous in my life than sitting in the conference room at this big Manhattan law firm, trying to convince this eminent translator that I could take care of her. Um, and I hope I've done a decent job of that. And I know somewhere Neil is shedding hairs off of that damn beard of his and beaming proudly at this day and of everything that you've done and we've been able to do together. My only regret is that you weren't, you know, born a couple years earlier, so I guess they've been working together for 10 years, but it's getting there. <laughs> so thank you, I love you. Jim's story. I first met Edie at the 92nd Street Y, where she was teaching a course on Don Quixote. 
When I saw that entry in the Y catalog, I immediately decided that I stood to gain from taking that course, since it would provide the means for me to force myself to read one of the classics of literature that I have thus far missed. Also on my mind, however, was the novel I was writing at the time with the title Problems of Translation. I decided problems could best be described as a picaresque, and I thought since Quixote is sometimes classified that way, there might be a few extras I could pick up about the genre itself. What I gained from that course was far, far more than I expected. Through Edie's great knowledge and teaching skills, I discovered that not only was Cervantes' work a genuine masterpiece, but it was perhaps what Edie often referred to it as, the best novel ever published. I was amazed, enthralled, and converted on the spot. Since that time, I have finished my own novel. It's been out for a year now. It won't come as a surprise, I'm sure, that uh, one or two quotations from Don Quixote uh, did uh, work their way into my novel. Uh, but it was, uh, as well as a quotation from Edie's own wonderful book, Why Translation Matters. In the years since, my beloved partner, Jill, and I have had the good fortune to dine with Edie on a few occasions. And not only did she prove to be a delightful dinner companion, but despite her incredibly heavy schedule, she took the time to read my novel and to write a blurb for it, which continues to adorn its cover. I recently received an email from Ben Fountain, the winner a few years back of the National Book Critics Circle Award for his novel, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. Ben, like Edie, is a friend who began as a mentor. When he heard I'd been invited to help celebrate Edie's 80th birthday, he replied, Your butts with Edith Grossman? <laughs> My God, that woman is extraordinary. Her translations of Garcia Marcus, among others, have opened entire worlds to me, and I'm sure a lot of other folks as well. Please tell her she has a huge fan in Dallas, Texas. Well. Dallas, Texas, in New York, in this room, in wherever it is in the, the world that they see, read books translated from Spanish into English, uh, you will find fans of Edith Grossman. It is indeed an honor for me to be able to express my gratitude, my admiration, and my deep, deep respect for Edith Grossman a sublime translator, an inspired teacher, and happily, a friend. Saludos, my name is Ricardo Alberto Maldonado. Two months before the prognosis that cancer procured direct to my father's body, my 10th grade literature teacher, a Jesuit in Puerto Rico, thought it sensible to have me set up somewhere to learn what we can bear of the world and thus, during my father's death and after, my two-volume Catedra Quixote in Spanish became my Bible. Yet, I can say now, some 20 years later, it has been through my rereading of Quixote by Edie's hand that I've been able to gain an understanding of those deeply broad, pained, and comical monologues of my youth at the fact of my father's death and the vagueness of his spirit. Because of Edie's work, I've come to appreciate Sancho and Quixote of my relative youth as predicates of my own need for understanding, or in brother terms, a reader. Each poet, it seems to me, is cursed by the psychological impetus and requirements of persona. We find ourselves often deeply bewildered, always advancing irreversibly toward something. So Edie, I have to thank you for the gift of your unwavering, meticulous, and courageous work as a reader and as a writer, because it had signaled to me to a more sensitive and intelligent art 
as well as a magnify as as well as magnify my own progress toward a more bearable understanding of my own life. Thank you. In the spring of my second year at Columbia, I ended up taking what turned out to be a transformational course in comparative translation with Rosemary. He brought so much insight, humor, curiosity, and care to texts she'd probably read a hundred times. By the end of our conversation as a class, though, we'd still feel as if we were able to delight in finding so many new windows and doors into what we were reading together. Madame Bovary, Tindra, Pedro Paramo, among others. She was open to that. Her openness to finding new possibilities in a text was infectious. On good to great days, I still feel that way when I'm working through the texts I'm co-translating now. Halfway through that semester, I made up my mind to apply for a Fulbright. In the space of only a few weeks, my sense of how I wanted to spend the next year of my life, or the next several, had changed pretty dramatically. I opened my statement of purpose for the grant with an excerpt from Why Translation Matters, which I'll read to you because this is what radicalized me as a translator. As the world seems to grow smaller and more interdependent and interconnected, while at the same time nations and peoples paradoxically become increasingly antagonistic to one another, translation has an important function to fulfill. It not only plays its important traditional role as the means that allows us access to literature originally written in one of the countless languages we cannot read. But it also represents a concrete literary presence with the crucial capacity to ease and make more meaningful our relationships to those with whom we may not have had a connection before. Translation always helps us to know, to see from a different angle. As nations and as individuals, we have a critical need for that kind of understanding and insight. The alternative is unthinkable. I was ultimately given the grant, which funded a year's worth of research and translation in Costa Rica. And for the many people who've asked for pointers about successfully applying for Fulbright fellowships to fund any project in literary translation around the world, my only advice is to be sure to begin and end with you, Rosemary. <laughs> through so many of her translations, through the path-breaking book on why it matters, through the course and through conversations we've shared about New York, about pregnancy, about Sorjuana, circumference, and motherhood, Grossman has so generously helped me to know, to see my life's work and my life and the literature I've encountered along the way from so many different angles. For example, her kindnesses, encouragement, her generosity, and warmth mean more to me and to many of us in this room than she could possibly know. Such an honor to celebrate this day with her. She's given us so much to celebrate. I remember you. Edith Grossman and I met so many years ago that we have different versions of that first meeting. <laughs> According to her, we met in a workshop taught by the wonderful Chilean poet Enrique Lin at a place that used to be called the Center for Inter-American Relations. It doesn't surprise me that Edith, being the passionate lover of poetry that she is, would remember the origins of our friendship under the auspices <laughs> the auspices of Calliope, the muse of poesy. My memory of our first meeting is not as highbrow as hers. <laughs> I remember meeting her at a party in the early 1980s where we danced salsa. <laughs> so, poetry, salsa, who knows? <laughs> but regardless of how we met, I've been look, lucky to be her friend for over 30 years. Tonight, I would like to mention just a couple of the countless ways I admire her. A former student of ours shared with me a telling anecdote that illustrates, in my opinion, a quality that's common among geniuses, fertility and capacity for work that's rare among mere mortal beings. Edie worked for over two years translating Don Quixote, while Garcia Marquez's autobiography, Living to Tell the Tale, had been waiting for her because Garcia Marquez did not want anybody but Edie to translate his book. So, the student told me, I asked Edie, after you finished translating Don Quixote, did you take a vacation? Mm. Edie replied, that night, to celebrate, I went to see a movie. And the next day, I started translating Cabo's book. 
I also have great admiration for Edith Grossman, the writer. Anybody who has read her essays knows that she's one of the peerless stylists of the English language. Only a writer who has a command of English comparable to Cervantes' and Garcia Marquez's command of the Spanish language could have achieved in English what she has done so masterfully and so elegantly. Her command of English is so awesome that at a Thanksgiving celebration some years ago, when her family decided to play after dinner a game of Scrabble, I said that I would play only if he did play with one eye covered and one hand tied behind him. <laughs> <laughs> of the writers I admire, she reminds me the most of the French novelist Honoré de Balzac, author of the body of work known as La Comédie Humaine. Balzac, as we know, wrote more novels than Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> <laughs> like Balzac, whose subject was the totality of the human condition, Grossman has translated indefatigably, rendering splendidly into English many masterpieces that encompass beautifully, wisely, with great depth, sensitivity, and intelligence, the best that the Spanish language has to offer to world culture. Tonight, I would like to wish my beloved friend Edie another 80 years filled with creativity, poetry, and love. John Siciliano from Penguin Classics. Happy birthday, Edie. Um, I've published just one book of Edie's, um, her beautiful translation of Gondoro's Solitudes. Um, and I'm honored that she trusted me with it and honored to have been invited here today. Um, when I first met Edie, she was, I now realize, doing the math, 73. She was as ageless as she is now. I met her in the way that many editors come to introduce themselves to eminent literary figures by asking for a blurb. <laughs> I got the blurb, and since then, over email and over drinks, I've looked to her for many things, for inspiration, for thoughts on writers, both classic and contemporary, for advice on what kind of gin to order. <laughs> and so naturally, I look to her when thinking about what to say today. In her translator's note to Don Quixote, she opens by quoting Cervantes' prologue. Cervantes writes in Edie's English, I picked up my pen many times to write it, and many times I put it down again because I did not know what to write. And then Edie writes, Cervantes' fictional difficulty was certainly my factual one as I contemplated the prospect of writing a few lines about the wonderful utopian task of translating the first and probably the greatest modern novel substitute keyboard and monitor for pen and paper, and my dilemma and posture were the same. Dear friend who helped me solve the problem is really Cervantes himself. When I realized I could begin this note by quoting chapter sentences from his prologue. And so by quoting Edie, quoting Cervantes, a pattern that foreheads might have spun into an infinitely recursive hall of mirrors, <laughs> you'll be happy to hear I can't. I found it Edie my Cervantes, the dear friend who pointed the way for me, as she has many times since I've known her. This was hard to imagine seven, seven years ago. Before I met her, I regarded Edie the way you regard literary masterworks you've not yet read, with awe and wonder and a little trepidation. When I first saw her, regal, commanding, her crown of white ringlets offset by her onyx black garments. I could easily be convinced she was holding a scepter. <laughs> she seemed equal to the literary monuments she had translated. But when I finally met her, introduced by Suzanne Jolene, after a panel discussion one Saturday on the Upper East Side at the Philatidi Center, which is where I asked for the blurb, and then again, right after coming to an agreement for Penguin Classics to publish her own direct translation, at a dinner party hosted by the late scholar of medieval Spain, Maria Rosa Menocal, who had invited Edie to Yale to deliver the lectures that became the basis of why translation matters. She became like the literary masterworks you have read, the dear friends you turn to again and again, the ones you're immeasurably enriched by, and that you can't imagine not having a part of your life. 
now when we meet for drinks, and I can hardly believe I get to say that, um, I'm intoxicated not just by a woman as commanding in her mastery of two languages and countless linguistic registers as she is in her bearing, but also by what, I, what else I've come to appreciate as I've gotten to know her. Her New York by way of Philadelphia pugnacity, her sheer delight in language, her evangelism, her great writing, professionalism, her never having missed a deadline, her gratitude and humility toward the writer she translates. She repeatedly describes being overwhelmed and stunned, stunned by the work. I've even come to appreciate even her not so teasing broadsides against everyone's favorite villain, publishers, <laughs> especially when her forceful indignation yields in friendship to whispered confidences and her Cheshire cat grin. <laughs> Edie, you have brought into English so many monuments of literature that we now consider our dear friends, and I feel very lucky to count you two among my dear friends. And like Cervantes and Shakespeare, whom we celebrated mere days ago, to count you among the greats. for the least amount of time of anyone speaking here tonight. In fact, just a few months ago, she was still Professor Grossman in my mind. And uh, thankfully, that situation was remedied with a bit of uh, Brazilian cachaça, so <laughs> cheers. Uh, since I have no old anecdotes or tales of grand adventures to share about our guest of honor, as I'm sure many people here do, I thought I might contribute with a view on how Edie is as a teacher when she is set loose to create her own curriculum. The class I took with her last year was a wonderfully titled Writers You Should Know More About. <laughs> but never mind how it was called, the students packed in the tiny room were all there because they were interested in the instructor's name, more than that of the name of the seminar. We were all eager to devour Professor Grossman's brilliant translations of some of the world's greatest authors. We were all ready to be enthralled by her stories of phone calls with Gabo and road trips with Mutis. Uh, even her opinions on jazz, and yes, even sometimes insights into translation. Uh, but whatever she had to say, uh, we were there to listen. The class might as well have been called Let ED Be ED, a delightful way to spend the semester. You would be hard pressed to find a professor as open and given with their opinions and advice than ED, for which we were all grateful. When I was invited to speak here, I doubted that I would have uh, any insight to offer or any praise for Edith Grossman beyond what is already obvious to everyone here and to the world. But after thinking back through our interactions, I realized my purpose here is maybe not of enlightening, but of representing. So here I am on behalf of a new crop of writers and translators who come into the trade already aware and in awe of Edie's contributions to literature. We don't just read Cervantes Quixote, we read the Cervantes Grossman Quixote. We pack the events where she's speaking, we learn from her talent and generosity, and so it's no surprise that we hear from the upstars to the illustrious uh, want to celebrate her, and in fact, it's about time, so cheers. Hello, everyone. Hello, Edie. My name is Alton Price, and unfortunately, Jonathan Golovsky, one of Edie's uh, publishers could not be with us today. So as a translator um, who often remains in the shadows, I, I'm quite happy re-expressing someone else's best wishes for you today. So uh, Jonathan is with here, us in spirit. Um, here's his thoughts for you. I have always admired the vitality and passion for literature that lie at the heart of Edie Grossman's approach to translating. You can see it in the vividness and fidelity of her work. Edie is not a professional, though she is consummately serious about what she does. She is an amateur in the original sense. She loves what she does, and we are all the beneficiaries of her no-holds-barred commitment to her calling. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Daniel Shapiro, the City College of New York, and editor of Review, Literature, and Arts of the Americas. Like many of those in this room, I first met Edith Grossman from a distance by reading her masterful translations of classics by Latin American authors, 
beginning with Garcia Marquez's Love in the Time of Cholera and continuing with those of many others, such as Carlos Fuentes, Myra Montero, and Myron Vargas Llosa. I got to know Edie more professionally when I invited her to participate in public programs at the Americas Society, where I worked for many years as Director of Literature and Editor of Review Magazine. Among these were a Chilean literature series in 1990, shortly after that country returned to democracy, a translation event with Colombian author Alvaro Mutis, whose images you've seen in John Cohen's presentation, and whose Macroll novellas Edie rendered into English so poetically, a fiery reading with Mexican poet David Huerta, and an evening of Cuban literature at the Cape Playhouse at Hunter College. I was proud to present her in a lecture on her lauded translation of Don Quixote in 2003, and in a conversation with Mario Vargas Llosa after his receipt of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2010. She delivered eloquent personal eulogies to Fuentes and Alistair Reed in memorial events for those two titans of Latin American writing and translation. Edie brought her signature charm and sense of humor to her presentations. During one in particular, I remember handing her a microphone as she began speaking to the audience arrayed before her. I feel like Frank Sinatra, she quit. <laughs> Edie has been a welcome and frequent contributor to Review Magazine, the major US forum for Latin American literature and translation. Since before my time, beginning with her translation of Macedonia Fernandez's strange and original story, Surgery of Psychic Removal, in Review 10 in 1973, as, as was also um, uh, shown in the, in the images previously. And she's also contributed prose and poetry and other pieces by many authors uh, throughout the years and, and her own writing. Uh, during my own ongoing tenure with Review, which now continues in a new venue at CCMY in association with Routledge Publishers, I've had the opportunity to commission texts from her including a memorial piece on her dear friend Alvaro Mutis, a text on Nicanor Para, marking his 100th birthday, and translations of work by contemporary writers such as Santiago Roncaliolo, uh, who by whose short story collection, Hi, This is Conchita, she'd been working on at the time, and the title piece of which revolves around the topic of phone sex. <laughs> on a more personal note, Edie encouraged my own creative development, in particular my translation of Sipango, a poetry collection by Chilean poet Tomas Harris, as well as graciously reading my own poetry and sharing some of hers with me. And I recall one about Humphrey Bogart, replete with cigarette and fedora. I've also had the opportunity to spend time with her socially, discussing literature, politics, and times gone by and to come over bottles of Marques de Cáceres in her cozy yet spacious apartment on the Upper West Side and over steam mussels at her favorite restaurant, uh, also on the Upper West Side. In all of these, she has been at once Edith Grossman, the renowned translator, and also just plain Edie, one of the most authentic people I've had the fortune to get to know. So here's looking at you, Edith, for future collaborations and more good times in the years to come. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Errol McDonald. culture still tends to think of literary translation as the result of a marriage of author and translator. A marriage wherein it's never possible for the author, always of singular sanctity and incorruptibility, to be guilty of infidelity. <coughs> as to the translator, however, he or she might always be up to something might always be up to no good. <laughs> For me, things get a little complicated when I start thinking about writers who have translated themselves. Beckett, Nabokov, and Borges come to mind, of course. But so do Strindberg, Blixen, and Tagore. In such instances, which text is really the so-called original, and which the translation 
in view of the opportunity for correction. As you can see, the situation is ripe for marital mischief. And part of the mischief of translation is an unresolvable mystery. No great translation, even as it engages its supposed Ur text, can ever be merely the spectral reflection of an awe-inspiring precedence. It must insist upon its own imaginative space, its own originality. Contra Nabokov, who knavishly remarked that, quote, the clumsiest literal translation is a thousand times more useful than the prettiest paraphrase. But useful to whom and for what? What strikes us about a great translation is its rhetorical persuasiveness, its jouissance of figuration, the powerful elegance of its inevitability. I know of no translator alive today who surpasses Edith Grossman in this respect, who matches, as Harold Bloom puts it, the extraordinary quality of her prose having translated from the Spanish the novel that contains all novels, as well as works by Nobel laureates and other essential writers of our time. Edith Grossman is herself, for the aesthetic glory she has achieved and given us, a major player in contemporary world literature, a major player in this, our world republic of letters. Happy birthday. <laughs> My name is Marianne Newman, and I'm thrilled to be honoring you at the Institute of Cervantes so today. Uh, a tribute to be read by anyone beyond the immediate circle of friends, loves, and family always runs the risk of becoming elegiac. And that would be the worst possible way to talk about Edith Grossman. Aside from her ex exquisite grasp of nuance, or maybe indeed because of it, Edie has the most sensitive bullshit detector known to woman. <laughs> <laughs> Encapsulated in her trademark bilingual expression, when something just plain rings false, dame un break. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking plainly then, Edith Grossman is a cluster of contradictions a connoisseur of style with no patience for rhetoric, a sensualist with a ramrod work ethic, an adorable curmudgeon, a citizen of the world who, given her druthers, would rather not leave her house. <clears throat> so others go to her as the mountain goes to Muhammad. In these days of Skype and texts and virtual relationships, Edie has gathered around her a gaggle of passionate readers of poetry, poetry, books, whose only common traits are love of literature and love of eating. The enticement that keeps this group of busy, sometimes weary New Yorkers returning month after month is the sheer pleasure of reading along with her and drinking lots of red wine. Why? Because Edith Grossman is the embodiment of literature, and I mean that quite literally. Douglas Robinson writes about translation as a physical art, as a somatics. He says a poet tastes and smells and feels words, that in fact everyone feels words, but only a poet or a translator knows how to isolate that feeling and subject it to analysis, understand why it feels the way it does, and set it down, translate it onto paper. Edith is so deeply sensitive and sensual that I have this impression that she feels and smells and touches and tastes her way through books in the same way she feels and smells and touches and tastes jazz and dancing and Beethoven and movies and sex and whiskey with every nerve and pore. Oh, and pork. I forgot about the pork. <laughs> <laughs> this is the pleasure Edie brings to every endeavor and every encounter, even the ones that provoke her characteristic dame un break. And the pleasure radiates to everyone around her. That's what keeps her friends coming back each month for more poetry and wine the pleasure of Edie and the pleasure of the text. Hello, 
ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear participants in this event, dear Edith. Uh, I'm very, very happy to, to be bestowing today the decoration that the Spanish government has granted Edith Grossman, not only as a consul of Spain for cultural affairs, but as well as an admirer and uh, as a simple individual. But before proceeding with the ceremony, uh, I would like to thank the Pen Club for letting us do this ceremony of the bestowal of the, of the decoration at the end of the, this, this event. It is Grossman making translation matter. And specifically, I feel very grateful to Margaret Carson for helping us coordinate the ceremony and then, of course, to the Instituto Cervantes and its director, Ignacio Olmos, for hosting us today. Edith, I can't think of no better place on time for me to bestow this medal to you. It is an honor to be a part of this enthralling set of contributions to this homage to translation embodied in the person of Edith Grossman. What is there to add about Edith Grossman after this? Maybe only her best kept secrets. And although I don't know them, <laughs> don't worry, Edith. <laughs> Edith can rest assured it wouldn't have been me who revealed them. <laughs> What we do know is your age, eight years of an admirable life, which we celebrate today, and a brilliant career we all rejoice in witnessing. I remember the first time I met Edith. She was giving a talk at the Frick Collection, surrounded by Koi Pelson on Quixote tapestries. It was there and then that I realized that Don Quixote's power of seduction could still make such an important conquest in the person of Edith. Because, as we all know, she turned her gaze toward Cervantes late in her career as a translator, a career that was until then mostly devoted to literature in Spanish, mostly literature in Spanish, in American, Latin American literature. One of the main reasons that sustains this well-deserved medal. And this is an invaluable present, not only to Spanish and world literature, but specifically to the entire English-speaking world. I mean, your work the amount, amazing number of, of, of words that you have translated and worked on. And I ask myself, why is it so, this conquest of Edith by Don Quixote, by Cervantes? Why did she fall under the spell of Cervantes, uh, Cervantes after so many years? And I think that maybe it was because she, in translating him, she really deciphered some of the main secrets of mankind, not those secrets that Cervantes, I think, was able to reveal. Fantasy and compassion. Two things that certainly define us as human beings better, even, than writing and speaking. In a certain way, Don Quixote wants to translate mentally an age that had passed, and in doing so, Cervantes was revealing a new one, a new age, and at the same time conveying to the world a new way of being. Cervantes shows us very often, I think, how awareness of an entirely new world is so close or closer than we expect that we can't see it, and how sometimes it is a question of experiencing fantasy to the extreme of madness, to find in this madness a grain of truth, a new grain of truth. Being a translator myself, I have always taken as a reference that wonderful chapter, chapter of Illuminations by Walter Benjamin, which I'm sure you know. But if you let me quote, it is the task of the translator to release in his own language, that pure language that is under the spell of another, to liberate the language imprisoned in a work in his recreation of that work. And I think this is what Edith has been doing or at least one of the things that she has been doing, not only with Don Quixote, I'm sure now with the novelas ejemplares, but with all her work, transporting it to a 20th century language. Now, if you let me fantasize a bit, I would like to imagine what Cervantes would have said if he could have read Edith's translation. Maybe, as Gabriel García Márquez once said of his own work, he would have preferred Don Quixote in Edith's English translation. But maybe I'm getting a bit carried away under the influx of Walter Benjamin <laughs> and the magic of this phenomenon that we call written language when one way or another it becomes literature. 
And now let me proceed with a more serious, uh, everything is serious, but I mean with a more formal, that's the right word, part of this ceremony. The Order of Civil Merit aims to reward the merits of civilians, Spanish or foreign, who provide or have provided relevant services to the Spanish state, such as extraordinary works, profitable initiatives, exemplary constants in the performance of their duties, or a remarkable collaboration in all matters that benefit the nation. The Order of Civil Merit was instituted by King Alfonso XIII by royal decree of June 25, 1926, to reward, to reward the civic virtues of officials in the service of the state and the extraordinary services of Spanish and foreign citizens for the good of the nation. In short, Edith Grossman is a privileged partner due to her professional prestige, her constant commitment to the Spanish language, and a high-mindedness that she has always put in the performance of his tasks and duties. Reasons which are more than enough to make her worthy of this order, which at the same time gains in prestige with the inclusion of Mrs. Grossman. And please, please, please. I'm going to read aloud. Okay. Shall I stand? And I need my collaborator. We know that we have the decoration there. I am going to read aloud just the text. Philip VI, Queen of Spain, as proof of my appreciation to Edith Grossman, I have sent fit to appoint you by royal decree dated December the 5th, uh, December the 5th, 2014, with the officer's cross of the Order of Civil Merit. Therefore, I confer upon you the honors, distinctions, and insignias established by the Order's statutes. I'm confident that you will contribute with the qualities that distinguish you to the greatest splendor of the Order given in Madrid at the Royal Palace on December the 5th, 2014, and the signed the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation. speak. I'm so touched by everything I've heard today um, and by actually having a medal on my shirt. I, I, it's, it moves me beyond words and I want to thank you very, very much. And I want to thank all the authors whose work has given me so much pleasure. so much pleasure in translating them. I don't know who else to thank. Uh, the world, the universe. Uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful moment in my life. Thank you. Uh, I was asked to read something that I had translated, and I came prepared with two sonnets. But the truth of the matter is, I am so very moved by um, everything that was said here today that I don't think I can get through 28 lines of poetry, even if I translated them. So if you want to know what you missed, I was going to read a sonnet by Sor Juana on why a portrait is so foolish. And I was going to read a sonnet by Quevedo saying that love lives far past the death of the body. Um, 
And he says, even when I'm gone, uh, I will be ashes, but ashes that are in love. It's mm. the greatest love poem I've ever read. But I, I really can't, um, you can hear my voice is disappearing. Mm. Um, I really can't read them. And my eyes are wet because I'm so touched. And I thank all of you very, very much from the bottom of my 80-year-old heart. <laughs> I, I thank you. Thank you.